What's up, friends? Matthew K. Hafey here with another episode of Fishman Presents. Today, we talk to my longtime pal, Mark, from the band Suicide Silence. We talk about the upbringing, what got him into music, what ultimately led him down the path to getting into Suicide Silence. But he took a detour at Black Metal, which I was very excited to learn about. Let's see what we got. Uh, there there he is. What's up, man? Great to see you. Hey, good to see you, too. Man. Long time no see. Damn. It's been quite a while. I saw, I saw you from afar in, uh, in Mexico. Oh dang! Uh, the Hell in Heaven Fest. Yeah, the one the, the with the mysterious <sighs> beer. That was a disaster. I haven't had a show like that. That was like the most disastrous show I think I've ever had. <laughs> Honestly, same. We played it like the night. It was like forty degrees, Jeez. literally. It was so cold, so cold. But Man, it was, it was it was miserable. Yeah, it was just so strange too because like we couldn't tell what the hell was happening. We kept asking the crowd, and the crowd just. It's like, what are you telling me? I, my vocals up. We kept turning it up and up, and it was it was bad. Anyway, anyway, yeah, was I was fun. reflecting when I knew I was talking today. I was remembering. I think one of the first long conversations we had was Albuquerque Mayhem Fest outside by the bus parking on that that hill. I remember that was like one of the first times I ever got to chat to you. It was either on the hill or it was by the backstage. It's one of those two, but that Albuquerque venue for Mayhem. I kind of remember, I think you might have been doing some jujitsu or something and you would maybe wrapped up and we started talking. Yeah, I, I, I think it was, I, it was something along those lines. Yeah, something along yeah. those lines. But I remember that was one of the first times we chatted. So yes, pleasure Can to you, have you on here. Everyone's stoked. Yeah, cool. Yeah, love the shirt. Um, so today, yeah, I, I wanted to actually, this is going to be cool for me because I never got this story myself, but I want to go back to the beginning of when you first started getting into music, when you first started getting into heavy music and when you first decided to pick up an instrument. Like what was all the driving factors in that? How old were you? Where were you at? All of that. Sweet. Sounds good. I'm awesome. Down. Awesome. Yeah. So let's let's take us to the beginning of your musical journey. When did you first start noticing music? When did it first make an impact on you? And when were you like, I like this stuff? My house is a musical household. You know, my yeah. as long as I can remember, my my dad was a guitar player. My dad played all different kinds of music. Uh he studied jazz. Uh, was literally like a well-learned, learned guitar player, like just knew, knew everything about theory, all of this stuff. And, uh, it's total, totally into art. Uh, and that inspired my older sister to start playing saxophone. This was all before I, my sister's seven years older than me. So as long as I can remember, there was instruments around me. Um, I remember when my sister switched from saxophone to French horn, uh, I remember the first time that I wanted to play music, I used to wake up. My sister was already at school. I would sneak in her room and I would steal her CDs and bring them down to the garage where like the good sound system was. And I would listen to whatever she had, like Appetite for Destruction, uh, Offspring Smash, Green Day Dookie, um, like Method Man. Like there was all kinds of different stuff in there, you know, uh, Wu-Tang Clan. Uh, <laughs> uh but no joke. And like, I just recently started saying this because it was like, not that cool, like, you know, for a while, but uh, yeah, Green Day Dookie was what it was, was like, I was listening to, I think probably like basket case or something. And even one of my dad's guitars would be like in the garage and I would like air guitar on it, even though I had no idea what I was doing. And I was listening to Green Day and I'm just, I just feel, I remember it as an energy and just hearing whatever the hell is going on right here, I want to be a part of whatever this energy is. It wasn't like I want to play guitar, I want to sing, I want to do, I want to play something. It was just like I want to be a part of this, and that was the beginning of it. That was that was really the beginning right there. And I used to just put music on and just like smash on my dad's guitar strings. He hated that I would do it, but <laughs> did it anyway. Um, but yeah, that's like really where the actual beginning beginning was. And that was probably first or second grade. Dang, that's awesome. That's awesome. And, um, if you don't mind me asking what year were you born? Cause like Dookie was also a huge record for me as well in middle school. 87, 87. Okay. I'm 86. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think I probably was, I don't know, I guess seven. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right around when I would have gotten that album as well. Because when I heard that, I didn't get to get a rock first. So like my dad always had metal and classic rock playing. It really didn't set with me. I, didn't, I wasn't really diving, diving into it. But I saw like it looked like guitar was the cool thing. And in, growing up in Central Florida, it was all pop punk and ska. That's like all it was. It was like Green Day and Offspring, Less Than Jake, Real Big Fish. And that Dookie record, I was like, this is this is pretty amazing. And that's right when they started blowing up. So <laughs> what? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. 
here too in Southern California. I mean, I'm in Temecula and I'm right near Orange County. So Sublime, no doubt, Blink-182, like all that pop punk and ska was huge here too. Like everyone was kind of punk, yeah. you know, or punk at the time. Yeah, you know? yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so when did you first start hearing heavier stuff? When What was the first record and the, the age? So it wasn't really too much longer after that because the other thing about my dad is he was kind of in the 80s rock scene like he met he studied jazz and did all that but he was also play, like when he was a playing musician he played in an 80s rock band and there was always kind of these stories of like oh you know we played in the 80s we played with quiet riot when randy rhodes was in the band at these parties and like there's like did, he did some cool stuff really what it was for me was i got into ozzy i got into sabbath i got into randy rhodes um and like, as far as metal, that was like kind of the first metal was Black Sabbath. And my mom did the, like the worst thing was, I remember being at a mall, I think I was in like fourth grade or something like that. And I wanted to get a Black Sabbath shirt at a, at Hot Topic or something. And my mom's like, you know, that Ozzy is no, a known uh, devil worshiper, right? And like, Hell yeah. <laughs> you know, like, want one even more, you know, yeah. <laughs> just, you know, but uh, yeah, Sabbath, Sabbath was kind of the, the kickstart of it. And that was kind of the golden era of Ozfest. So like, you know, 97, 98, 99, uh, like Ozfest was just starting. And like seeing those lineups, it would just be like, who are these bands? Napster, get on Napster, you know, like start looking things up. Cause, uh, um, and I, I remember another one, a big one was my neighbor brought over a, oh, I can't even remember the name of the sampler. But I haven't thought about this in so long, but it had it had Slipknot and Coal Chamber and Meshuga and like all kinds of stuff. And there was just this one day we were like swimming and we used to set up the boom box and put music on and go swimming and play Marco Polo and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and and that one day we were, I, I heard all kinds of just really extreme like it, I had never really heard the scream anything with like harsh vocals. And uh, yeah, just heard all kinds of stuff like American Head Charge and all kinds of you know the new metal stuff um yeah all that in one in one kind of junt that kind of it kind of jump started me but i was definitely more into like classic kind of stuff like i was i like i i got heavy into metallica and pantera and sepultura and you know all of all of that kind of stuff but really yeah it was ozzy sabbath started it all for me that's that's really where it was and still is i mean sabbath and Ozzy's the Ozzy is the goat. The goat. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, when you talk about samplers, it made me think of I think it was ninety seven or ninety eight. The Family Values sampler was one that I got. That was like huge for me. That was the first time I heard. I think Kid Rock Ba with the Ba was on there, and like Orgy's Platinum, which I still love that song very very much. Uh, like Limp Bizkit, Corn, Rammstein. That was a good time for like compilation CDs like that. Like the movie eras as well. Like the Spawn soundtrack, Mortal Kombat soundtrack. Um, Queen of the Dam soundtrack, I think it's one of the, my favorite movie soundtracks of all time. Yeah, so it was like right around the same era of things that you and I were getting into. Um, so what did you start doing around this time? When did you decide, hey, I'm going to put a band together? Did you put together a band before Suicide Silence? Did you have any of that stuff going on beforehand? Yeah. Um, so I before I even started playing guitar, though, I, I was in school band. And I, I played the French horn and I learned how to, yeah, because my because I was doing what my sister did. There was already a French horn in the house. So I'm like, oh, right. I'll just play the French horn. I don't even, and Jurassic Park, you know, you want to learn to play the Jurassic Park song. Um, but yeah, I was in school band and I kind of got introduced to all different kinds of musicians. And I saw people were already playing drums and I met like a, a, somebody that played guitar and could play some some of the songs that I liked. Like, you know, they were they were into the who and into Rolling Stones and into like classic stuff. And um pretty much what what ended up happening is i realized like i want to play music with people and i couldn't really play music if i was playing like with people my age if i was playing the french horn <laughs> so i eventually was just like dad you want to give me guitar lessons i got he started teaching me stuff within like four or five months i kind of realized i'm like i think i'm pretty good at this like i think this is kind of coming naturally to me so anybody i would just ask people if they wanted to jam not that many people were into playing metallica or playing pantera or playing you know, heavier stuff. It was kind of like they wanted to play a little more of the modern stuff. They wanted to play Papa Roach and they wanted to play Lincoln Park and stuff. And I wasn't really like feeling that at the time. And it took me until 
first day of freshman year to know who some musicians around town were. And it's funny because uh, who, the first person I approached to start the first band that I was a part of starting was uh, Brandon Zaki, who's playing in Whitechapel now. And he was he's an enterpriser is in Enterprise Earth. Um, one of my best friends in the world. First day of freshman year between first and second period, like literally I'm just walking from like first class to second class. I'm like, I'm finding Brandon Zaki. I know that dude's sick at drums. Like I want to start a band with him. Uh, see him. I'm like, yo, Brandon, like, let's start like a black death metal band, like something crazy, you know, like, let's do like something, you know, Demu Borger, Children of Bodom, like, you know, he's, he's all about it right away. And then that first day, him and I put together a band called Nocturnal Symphony. <laughs> I like the name. I can already hear it in my head, the sound. <laughs> and, and yeah, there, there's, there's this other kid who's, he's a doctor now and I, I don't have too much communication with him. I, last time I saw him was at Barnes and Noble and he was about to go do an internship in Africa. Um, wow. Yeah, super, super smart guy, Matt Cappiello. And uh, he was, uh, we got him to pl play keys in the band. And dude, he's a savant. He taught me so much about writing music and just taught so we wrote 14 songs. We were only a band for like eight or nine months. And like we wrote like 14 songs. I should say he wrote like 14 songs and we were a part of it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the first band we started was Nocturnal Symphony. And we had, like I got heavy into black metal and like from the darkest, gnarliest black metal to the most, you know, kind of uh, symphonic, you know, modern kind of stuff that was going on we were way way i was way into bodum and some of them were like way into like carpathian forest and limbonic art and like all kinds of stuff so we were kind of exploring death and black metal kind of together as like kids yeah and yeah nocturnal symphony that was we we never really could uh put our thumb on like a good vocalist for the band and like the other guitar player didn't really want to be the vocalist so it kind of that's why it fell apart we couldn't find like the right thing to do um, and Matt was destined to be a doctor and not be a keyboard player in a black metal <laughs> band. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that was the first band and still around town. It's funny. Like people remember like, oh, I remember Nocturnal Symphony. I saw you guys at this, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So cool. That's like, so cool. That's, that's really interesting. That's like, I, I didn't know that, that that was your path. Like that was very similar to mine as well. Noticing the pop punk scene, getting into metal, then quickly getting into extreme metal. Like I would buy Bodum and In Flames VHS tapes off eBay because they wouldn't play Florida ever. And the closest place would be like Worcester. They play at the Palladium. So I'd have to like buy the VHS. I'd have to buy the bootleg shirts. Um, that's when they had like Metal Maniacs and stuff like those magazines. Um, yeah. I love that you got in that, that style of black metal too. I remember I met a guy named Richie Brown who's in black metal band called Mindscar who's now playing with I think Morbid Angel or I Am Morbid. And he got me into black metal and it was through same things like limbonic art. He got me to like Mythitin and more crooning and all those things. And it really sparked this different attraction to metal. Cause I was like, wow, this is this whole other world. These guys are dressing different. They're singing about old Viking lore. And I was really drawn to that. So that's, that's really cool. You're into that. I, I'd like to hear some of that music. That sounds fun. <laughs> oh man. Our only demo was recorded on like one of those old Roland uh, digital eight recorders. BR8. Yeah, BR8. I had yeah. the same thing. Yeah. 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 Well, <laughs> we didn't have one. We found like one of our friends had one and he's like, I'll record you guys. And then he didn't really know what he was doing. We didn't know what we were doing. We recorded <laughs> drums with the Roland, uh, like V drums. And then yep. the way that the way we recorded into it, we didn't have the right cable. So the, all of it sounded kind of blown out. Hey, man. Added, yeah, that's good. Was, <laughs> yeah. You know, like it added, it added to it, but it was like yeah. the wrong kind of bad. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, you know, it was like, it would still work out. Yeah. But, it's somewhere I know Brandon has one Brandon has a demo I don't have I don't have one anymore I don't know where it is but that's amazing you've known Brandon since then that's so cool yeah because we toured with them recently and I just uh did like a guest thing on the new Enterprise Earth uh single those, awesome. those guys are great band great great stuff oh dude yeah Brandon is the best it's cool too because it's like I kind of I started really early with touring and all of that stuff and like Brandon was he he was a blue devil and was traveling and doing drumline and doing music wow. in a different way and then now that he's like now that he's touring and all that like he is just kicking ass and killing it it's super cool yeah he's amazing um it's funny you mentioned like you know band instruments i always thought i played tenor saxophone so i never thought it was that cool you're probably like ah french horn what is this but now hans zimmer's made french horn cool again like he's obsessed with french horns they're in all his scores danny elfman i feel like made saxophone cool it's almost the stuff i wish i, I wish i got a danny elfman in high school because i was a uh, i was in marching band the lake brantley 
in high school Patriots. So we had dressed up as Patriots and I had to march with the saxophone. It was just never that cool. Um, but our drummer at the time was also in drumline. Um, so it's, yeah, I feel like school band kind of churns out some good heavy bands. <laughs> yeah, it sets the foundation. I'm really glad I learned to read music. Oh yeah, you can, you can reform. I can only read it on saxophone. I can't for guitar. I, I can, I can, I, I'm not like a sight reader. I can't look at it immediately and be like, all right, I know what's going on, but obviously like reading inside of, a, you know, whatever time signature it is, you know, notes, it'll take me a second to be like, okay, uh, let me figure that out. But yeah, it's, it's rare. You meet anybody that knows how to read music. Yeah. 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 It's funny. Uh, Corey, our, the guitar player, he like knows theory very well. And I, I never, I always kind of forget he knows theory. I'll be talking about, I don't know what notes playing this thing. He'll mention like the mode and the chord and the exact chord name. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. I, I don't know that. <laughs> I wish yeah, I did. Yeah. I wish yeah. I did know that. It's cool, but at the same time, you don't need it at all. Yeah. What's like I exactly. didn't. I I actually went without learning it really on on guitar for years, and then I kind of reversed it. Then once I was like, you know what, I want to do a little more theory and like learn more on the guitar, and then I went back, and now it started to all like make sense. Actually, during the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. That's what. That's, yeah. that's cool. You jumped into that. I think back to another Hans Zimmer thing. I've always been watching a lot of Hans Zimmer documentaries. He, I believe, doesn't really know theory either. And he traditionally, I, I think most of his songs, he like sticks in one key. Like he's written most of his stuff in D minor, which I was like, I thought I'd have to switch keys. I didn't know I could stick in a key. So John Williams, he wrote everything in like C major. Damn. Like That's everything. Awesome. Literally every Star Wars, Jurassic Park, uh, Indiana Jones, like all of that's C major. Damn. Which which is insane because that's like the what you learn when you start learning theory that's the first scale you learn usually yeah yeah <laughs> the first thing <laughs> yeah i was just in universal with my kids the other day and each park it's got the music it's like jurassic park world harry potter world it's like man this is like john williams land it's just john <laughs> williams freaking everywhere it's really cool dude well on on the tip of hans zimmer uh in germany last year i went to a hans zimmer john williams concert where holy I, a full a full orchestra played all the hits man there were the czech orchestra oh man they played everything they opened with harry potter it's like it's so it's so funny when you think about like let's put together a set list like yo we're opening with harry potter <laughs> straight into indiana jones into the lion king like <laughs> that's awesome yeah i was listening to the, the hans zimmer live thing yesterday leaving practice and i was wondering about the two i was like i wonder how they pick like hey let's lion king and then inception and what's we'll be fun you know what's really good? The Dune soundtrack that he did. Oh my god! So trippy, so trippy, oh, god, dude. Like that's, I mean, music. It's like it, it, it definitely blurs on like songs and scoring. It's like definitely more scoring, but like, damn, it's so good and it translates live way better. Like I've listened to it since I saw it. I'm like, oh, it's just so much better in person. Like it has that energy that you that you look for with like that. It's just, it's, it's hard to explain. It's just Man, so good. That's so fun. I'd love to hear stuff. The only thing I got to see like that live was uh, they did Harry Potter. I got to go to Harry Potter, Goblet of Fire live. So they play the movie, but then they have a symphony playing with it. And that's every year. My wife and I watch every Harry Potter. We're like obsessed with it. That sounds awesome. Yeah, yeah it's I, very, very fun. I just got into Harry Potter. I know that's really weird. I oh, just better late Harry than Potter. never, man. Have you seen all the movies yet? Uh, no, I, I, I'm on, I haven't. I'm on the fourth one. Okay, that's my that's my favorite. I, I love the fourth one. I love Half Blood Prince. I think I love the ones where they get to be normal for a while and nothing bad happens for a minute. They're like just being high school kids, which is such a weird thing to like. But I, those have been my favorite moments in those. It keeps getting darker. I feel like three is super dark, four is relatively dark, five's darker, and then the last couple are so. The film quality is so beautiful. The 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 landscape, the nature, the desolation is really really cool. So you're you're in for a treat. Something I'm noticing and how they're evolving in like the film quality. The beginning, the first one kind of seems like, oh, this is obviously the first one from yeah. 2000. You know, <laughs> yeah, very kitty, very kitty. And then it just gets like I love the the visuals of the final one, like just the the giant nature scapes. It's always been you'll love it too because being a black metal fan, like we just love nature for some reason. Oh, <laughs> Yep. <laughs> awesome okay so after nocturnal when did you start where did you go next like what's the path to suicide silence then what's crazy i mean okay so nocturnal symphony was freshman year and that pretty much only lasted that year and then uh, while i was doing that i was kind of meeting even more musicians in the area and what happened was there was a band called without restraint that they they were doing more like Chimera, Kill Switch, 
uh, like more like what was going on at the time, like a little more modern kind of things. And I would go to their rehearsals and hang out with them and, and like got to be good friends with them. And they only had one guitar player. And eventually they were like, do you want to join the band? So I joined this band called Without Restraint. Um, got more into like drop tuned, low tune kind of stuff. Nocturnal Symphony, we're just in standard E and, you know, doing that. So like I joined them, they were in drop C. I started exploring like lower tunings and figuring that kind of stuff out. And really, I'd only been playing guitar for three years or something at that time. Uh, so we got with I got with them. They were a little older than me. We played a lot more shows. We learned a lot about, you know, how to play shows, how to book shows, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, just be a little bit more professional, I guess, you know, however prof professional you could be when you're in high school. Um, that evolved into a band. We changed the name to From Agony Within, and we got a new drummer, and the drummer was in a band called Kettle Cadaver. And this is a really crazy band that has existed since 95. That's from where I'm from. They're technically from Lake Elsinore. Um, they were all older. They would play one show a year on Halloween, and <laughs> everyone knew who this band was. They're like, this is crazy stuff. Like, you got to look them up. Like, the singer would, like, cut himself on stage like no joke nailed his dick to a board on stage with one show. there's like a dvd out there they made a, a sundance movie about him called with dead hands dig deep and it's uh, a movie about their their band his name's edwin borsheim and he's actually norwegian yeah. had a norwegian accent he they all became kind of uh, like i learned a lot from them they were they were they were they were all about building mystique and like like how to like make people know who you are and all this it sounds so crazy but like if you look into kettle cadavers but with a k cadaver with a c um really crazy so uh sean duvall joined from agony within and then he showed us all kinds of stuff how do you put together a sampling a sampler disc and how do you throw like you rent a venue rent the showcase and throw a show and like how do you do all this stuff and he was when we were putting together a sampler cd where basically we he went around and talked to local bands and was like, "Give us a hundred bucks. We'll throw a song on your on a sampler CD. We'll give you ten CDs. You guys can sell them, make your hundred bucks back or whatever. Um, and it'll all together will help the whole you know Southern California music scene or heavy music scene. Uh, and then we threw a show. But in that, he reached out to Suicide Silence, and he was the one that told me like, check out this band. They're kind of like death metal, but they're like sludgy and a little different. Um." That's pretty much how I found out about Suicide Silence was through him. And this was 2002 or three. And it was right when they started. It was like right, right when they had started playing shows. And um, that's that was the introduction. And then I didn't really know them. I just kind of I, I, I saw them because they worked at Showcase Theater. And like I kind of started recognizing them. And I, I, I really will never forget because I went and saw God Forbid at Showcase 2003 and suicide silence was the opening band for god forbid and i was like i gotta show up early i want to see this band and I, I walked in and as soon as i they were already playing as soon as i saw them playing i could already tell like they were they were sick before i even really heard what was happening i just saw them i was like oh this is gonna be rad like singers wearing a mask mitch back then wasn't even fully tattooed but had more tattoos than most people and was just like lanky and like crazy looking and he gave off the like Hetfield on Selmo energy like had like this crazy energy um yeah I watched them play and I think I met them I met them a little bit that day uh and yeah I mean it was kind of like after Nocturnal Symphony the bands that I was in it was more involved in the in the scene like the scene was kind of bubbling and yeah that's what introduced me to to suicide and then once, you know, from Agony Within, it was kind of like everybody, they they kind of, everybody wanted to do with music so badly that they felt like they had to act like they already were professional. I think that's the way that I would look back. Like they already were pros. Like, oh, we already play every weekend. You know, <laughs> yeah. we're already there. We already made it. Yeah. And I just didn't really like the vibe of it. Like I, I kind of could tell I'm like, I'm so hungry and I want to do this so bad. I want to do, like, I want to be on tour. I want to do this forever. You know, whatever. And I eventually I quit that band. I was just like, you know, I don't really want to be involved with this anymore. I also kind of felt like I didn't want to be writing music. I felt like the Chimera Kill Switch Metalcore, that sound, I didn't want to be trying to do this. I already saw Atreyu and Avenged and all these bands getting bigger and bigger and signing big deals. I'm like, 
I think we're kind of missing the boat on this like trend, you know, like I want to do something different. I don't even know what I want to do. I just want to do something different. And that's why I quit. I told him I want to quit to do something, something different. And I was without a band for about three or four months. And then this was my space era. This was 2005. Uh, my, one of my really, really good friends, rest in peace, Daniel Leon. This is like a linchpin in my, in my world. Um, he was on, we would take turns checking our MySpace and he, and he, I just remember him on MySpace and he's like, Hey Mark, uh, suicide silence is having guitar tryouts. Like you should, you should hit him up and try out. And I was like, you know what? I should, that sounds like a good idea. So I hit up uh, their bass player. Cause I, I got his number at one point and literally that's how it happened. That's, that's what that was. I look at without restraint and for Magnet within is like this bridge between like playing crazy black metal kind of getting more involved in the scene and like being introduced to suicide silence and i was only 17 years old and tried out got the gig i mean more than got the gig i went and tried out hung out with them they were all cool and they gave me a live cd of them playing at the showcase and it was like this is the set we have a show in two weeks learn this we're gonna play it we're gonna practice two days before the show we're playing the whiskey and i'm like cool like i'll learn this and the the cd they gave me was them opening for aborted wow and yeah it's super super cool and that even more like they the way that i was in in into black metal and learning about all kinds of black metal stuff suicide silence when i joined them they were showing me the much more extreme like underground like grindy kind of stuff you know uh you know, origin and, uh, bolt thrower and, uh, uh, eternal suffering, like all kinds of stuff like that. But I learn all the stuff, show up to the whiskey. Uh, and I'll never forget this because as soon as we're walking on stage about to play, not only is the crowd like already chanting, like suicide, like, holy shit. Like the, the crowd knows the band, like this isn't freaking insane. I'm nervous as hell. Uh, Mitch, Mitch walks up to me pushes his finger in, in my chest three times. He goes, don't fuck up. And that, and then, like, that's right when we walk on stage. And that was, that was the first show I ever played with suicide silence. And it was sick, man. That's so cool. So many things that uh, were, were amazing about that story. I didn't know God forbid brought them out in like an earlier run. Cause God forbid brought us out on our first us tour ever. I think they brought avenged out on like a mushroom head run where one of their first runs, uh, that record is amazing. I think they were on determination around that time then when they would have had suicide out. And yeah. I remember when I first heard suicide no, silence it was oh, gone, forever. gone forever yeah. at the time when i first heard suicide silence and started seeing what you guys were doing seeing you live seeing the energy seeing the videos there was no one else doing anything like that like the taking the melding of the genres that you guys did and it was so exciting to see and so interesting to see like the the groundwork that laid for what would come now like i feel like you guys were doing that 2003 2004 2005 um which is really awesome really exciting and i was very curious like I, I love to hear that they were into the more grindy, techy, death metal stuff, and then you come in there from like extreme metal background with some like the Aussie stuff in the in the backbone. With Mitch, what was his style that he was into? Like, what was he into the grindcore stuff that he did? He bring that to the band because he he always had a very interesting presence, of course. Mitch was into all different kinds of stuff. Like that's that was always what was really cool about him. Like he was into the grindy really technical like extreme kind of stuff you know like he was the one that's like oh you got to check out origin i remember even him telling me like you got to check out all shall perish like all shall perish is super sick and uh but he was he was into yeah bolt thrower to converge big time uh but also he was way into sepultura he was way in he like you know metallica like classic stuff like that because uh, his dad showed him that kind of stuff so his dad took him like to see the uh, metallica on the black album tour uh and but the other thing is he was his favorite singer like i don't want to say his favorite singer but he was really into anthony green like he really liked seosin and um what's his other band um not well, one, sure i'm brain farting brain farts are contagious and i swear to yes, God, they are. Are. you know when, yeah, like, yeah, they are um, Anyway, Anthony Anthony Green's other band, uh, but he was also into like soundscapey stuff, explosions in the sky. Um, he really was into all different kinds of stuff. He liked, I, I think he was even listening to Thursday and stuff that I really didn't even like that much. Um, 
But Does Circa Survive? Circa Survive. Someone yeah. in chat got it. Which is such a it was just such a great band. Like such a great band. Um and he would he would always try to get us to like experiment more into those like sound like just strange sounds and like ambience and music. Um but he was kind of just into whatever he was into. Like it might have seemed like he was, you know, into the scene or like a part of some sort of uh, you know, something that was going on, but really I feel like he was he was a hundred percent himself. He was just totally him. And also way, way more uh like reclusive than people would have would like would think about him. You know, he was he would listen to stuff but wouldn't even tell you that he was listening to it because he didn't want you to know. Like he was, <laughs> he was like, Oh yeah, I don't want to tell people I'm listening to this. You know? That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. He was he was a he was he was a very, very unique individual. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, and I've been curious too. Do you see the groundwork that you guys laid that kind of opened the path up to these bands that have these, like you and I, both of our bands have seen the times where things were a lot more exclusive. Like these bands can't tour with these bands and this band shouldn't be with this band. We can't have this. And, but nowadays I feel like everything goes and everyone's cool with it, which is really interesting. It's really great. I wish we got to enjoy that more. Yeah. Yeah. But, I totally, I totally see that. And I feel like, um, I've always looked at it from the outside. Like as much as I've been heavily involved in suicide at silence, and it's something that I've been involved in for so long because I joined the band, I've always felt like I looked at the band, like from the outside and I'm like suicide silence. I observed what they were doing before I was in the band. And I saw that they were doing something different from the very, very beginning, you know, the way that they looked and the way that they sounded because of the the blending of they kind of looked like every local you know emerging scene band that in in our scene i mean southern california was bubbling at that time there were so many bands and uh yeah their their look and their sound it was like this crazy kind of mold of it and i noticed it right away like i could just see all the all these people kind of starting to want to do the moves that mitch was doing on stage and kind of say the same similar things like the way he was saying it I was seeing the influence really, really early on. Um, and yeah, nowadays it's kind of like, it's crazy. If It's like this, I, I say it like we're, we made this little dent in the heavy metal world where like, if you do listen to certain kinds of extreme music or even all extreme music, like pretty much it's almost required listening to kind of discover, you know, the early suicide silence stuff. And yeah, the new, it's like the second wave of death core that's happening right now, or it's kind of like a third wave really. Um, yeah. I mean, it's definitely, it's come around to where if I'm speaking to someone or doing like an interview, it's definitely come around where now it feels like I'm being spoken to, like I'm like, like I'm older and was, there's like a little more respect in there that like, it wasn't, wasn't there for years before, which is really, really cool. Uh, but it also kind of happened like overnight, like it just happened so quickly, very recently with uh, with, you know, Lorna Shore becoming so successful and, uh, you know, the whole new wave. And yeah, I see it 100 percent. And yeah, there wasn't it was not an easy kind of come up because when we were first starting, it was us touring with Behemoth and Nile and, uh, you know, death metal. Band. I remember seeing your name on all those like death metal tours. Yeah it did not work. It did not line up. Like we, we might've done decent because we had our hardcore fans that show up. And, you know, this is kind of like why, like I got quoted uh, by saying like gatekeeping is, is like required is like, it's kind of necessary in the scene, which like, I'm not saying I gatekeep or that I, that I think that any of that is, is the way it should be really what I'm, what I kind of meant by that is there was gatekeeping going on. And for a band like us, if we were going to go get on stage opening for a band like Nile or behemoth, half the crowd is 100% like these guys, fuck this shit. This yeah. sucks. But the people that showed up for us were so into it that it creates this absolute, you know, have to defend this, love this kind of music. So it creates this like complete dedication to it, which is why I'm like, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of necessary in some instances for some bands to become as popular as they are or has have as much success as they get. I would say it's probably the same thing for a band like Five Finger Death Punch. We did their first tour, their big tour on Mayhem, and the people that were into it were so into it, but the people that didn't like it absolutely didn't like it. 
it's like it draws a line in the sand. You choose which side you're on. So it's like, that's kind of what I meant by like, you know, gatekeeping is kind of required. And you probably experienced the same thing. I remember you guys couldn't tour with certain bands. <laughs> yeah. you know, it was a jockeys. crazy time. Yeah. I was just telling the story to the, to Caleb from Beartooth because we just did a co-headliner with them. And I was telling them as we were doing a San Francisco show that the show was insane, but I was like, man, I remember one of the first times we played San Francisco. The lineup was Children of Bodom headlining, which is freaking sick. It was us direct support, and it was a Monomarth opening. And we played at Slim's in San, San Francisco. During our set, the entire crowd booed us the whole set and spit on us the whole set. I remember supporting Lamb of God in 2006, 2007, coming off stage one day, and this guy comes in, he's like, good job, James. I'm like, what? He's like, James Hetfield, huh? You want to go? And he like pulls his fists up. Um, oh. We were always like too metal for the hardcore kids, too hardcore for the metal kids. Our look, just like you mentioned, look, um, ascendancy. That that record sounds like a death record to me, like the guitar parts. But they're like, ah, oh, it's an emo band. It's an emo band because of Matt's hair. And it's like, it's this weird dark time that bands like you guys and us got to see and had to live through. Like we did a co-headliner with Slayer in the UK. It was Slayer and Trivium co-headlining the UK, Mastodon Direct Support, Amanamarth opening. None of it was sold out. Like it wasn't sold out with the original lineup of Slayer. We didn't even sell out Manchester Apollo. Um, I remember when we went out, how y'all doing? half the crowd cheering half the crowd booing i was like all right who fucking hates us make some noise half the crowd did i was like ha i even got you to make noise and by the end like we got bottled through the set by the end they like, come around so it's like this interesting time that i don't know if people should have to go through that stuff like both our bands did i i just i don't know if it's not that i'm bitter about it i feel like it made us who we are it's just such an interesting time because we tell bands about that and they're like wow that just doesn't exist at all now which is great but I remember being like bullied by our favorite bands, bullied by our favorite bands, texts, our favorite bands, audiences, things like that. I'm happy that people don't have to go through, but it was just such an interesting time that we were coming out of that 90s, 80s stuff of when I feel like that's when that was at its peak. Like if you open for Slayer, you're probably going to die. But now it became something so different. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a strange thing. And I I saw it developing while this was all going on because it was just like you said, it was very harsh for us as well. I saw the way that it was coming along where I think it was 2014. We did the AP awards in Cleveland uh, by the rock and roll hall of fame. And it was like the people like who we were there with, it was like us and, and, and uh, Jonathan Davis from corn and uh, Ronnie Radke and asking Alexandria and machine gun Kelly and like all these people. And I'm like, okay, it's 2014. I'm like, every nothing matters anymore like ev everybody listens to everything which is very cool it just was not the way that it was and it was almost like when we were younger you kind of had to choose what you were a part of you couldn't really be a part of everything and now it's now it, it, it is cool it's like you can you can listen to whatever you want you could be a part of you can listen to k-pop and you can listen to lorna shore and you can listen to trivium and you know that's totally fine and that's totally cool and I probably I would have never seen it coming, and I don't think that uh, I don't think that people I don't think there's a very good way to grasp how it really was. Like you can't read. <laughs> yeah, it was good nuts. Yeah, it was, like how oh, it was horrible. I mean, I won't quote the band. But I remember we were supporting a band. One of our favorite bands were first of three. I played a riff from the headlining band's song. The guitar tech came up screaming at me, screaming. He's like, I'll kick you off this fucking tour right now. Like guitar techs aren't yelling at people anymore. Or I remember another tour, one of our favorite bands, guitar tech comes up to me. He's like, hey, you know, what? do you know why my guys don't like you? I'm like, what? Why? He's like, you got, you got those amps for free. I was like, I, and then the guy walked away. I'm like, I'm sorry. And yeah. it was like a band I loved. It was just such a weird, weird time. But it's cool because like uh, we played the Dallas show, Frozen Soul came out and uh, they pointed out they're like, man, I just saw a guy crowd surfing with a dying fetus shirt during Beartooth set singing the Beartooth lyrics. He's like, I'm not used to seeing this. He's like, this is this is nuts. And it's just so interesting that it's gone this way. Like, I think it, it helps heavy music in every way because it allows heavier bands to kind of get in like different places than it would be. But, I, you know, I don't want to sound like one of those like oh, I'm back in my day. But yeah, back in our day, it was so different. But I feel like it made us who we are at the same time. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I We did a tour what, where it was Slayer, Megadeth, Machine Head, and we opened. And it was a shorter tour. It was all Canadian uh, arenas. And it was our first arena tour. This was 2009. And back then, we going on that tour, we were terrified because we were like oh they're gonna they're gonna hate us we're going on this first huge tour we've ever gone on and like 
we literally thought it was going to be awful. Like the, no one's going to like it. We're going to have our 200 people in the front that are going to be down with it. And there was one show where it was a warm up show before it started. And it was just us and Slayer in Spokane at the show box, I think, or maybe it was the knitting factory. Um, and that was the most terrifying. Like we have to open for Slayer like this, just us like this is going to be terrible. So the, the the lights go down before we're about to play and the crowd like, we hear the crowd like, ah, oh, like make a bunch of noise. And we're like, oh God, they think we're Slayer. Like, this is <laughs> terrible. And like, we do our thing, we go out on stage and literally it was one of the best shows of our lives because like the crowd pretty much liked it. You know, it yeah. wasn't like everyone wasn't booing and spitting on us. Yeah. We're like, okay, it actually worked like yeah. good. You know, like that's how it was back then. Like you'd yeah. be afraid to open for Slayer. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's amazing. It's yeah, it's, it is good. It, it is. I, I do like telling you know, the, the stories to kind of like the bands that are out now, because I, I hope people can appreciate how how nice it is that we can do essentially any kind of bill, any kind of tour, any kind of thing. And it, and it works and it makes sense. I think that it's a very good thing. It's, it's a good good thing for all heavy music and for all heavy bands. Totally. Yeah, it's nice. Nice reminiscing that stuff with another band ma- ma- who's gone through that stuff. Um, so, yeah, so that takes us up through the history. So what's what's now? What's on the books for you guys now? What what's happening now? What's the current plan? What are you guys up to? What's next? Well, we just released a record in March called Remember You Must Die. Um, we are we're pretty much trying to get on all of these uh these festivals. We just played uh incarceration and doing some of the DWP stuff. We're playing louder than life. We uh, along with the kind of uh where you could play or couldn't play, we've never really been on those those festivals. It's it, for years it was kind of a little more radio kind of stuff. And now we're finally getting on them and uh able to play in front of that kind of those larger audiences in the U S. So that's like, that's very, very cool for us. And we're really stoked about that. Uh, we're penciling, uh, some stuff in the U S uh, this year, and we're just going to be touring on this new record. And literally we just got off a a meeting yesterday. We're like, when are we going to start writing new music? So we're, we're going to start new music and, uh, do some, uh, yeah, it's, uh, some content creation we're gonna do work on some stuff and uh, work on uh, on our uh on that whole thing because that's where it's at nowadays you know <laughs> and creating some content but uh pretty much i mean we're we're just we just want to stay brutal and do heavy stuff and and make some badass music for everybody that's where my head's at like i'm sitting at this i'm setting up a new studio in my house right now so that's that's what i'm doing and i'm gonna get off this call or this 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 set up some stuff and uh, literally start working on some some new suicide silence music is what I'm oh yes do. man that's so awesome i'm so happy to see everything's going so well i'm so happy to get this story because i've i've been a fan of you guys since i first heard you guys so i'm very excited for everything it's so good to chat to you so good to finally get to know you a little better like and it's been years but it's it's been a pleasure yeah i know yeah we've been around for i remember i remember going to your guys's uh like i forgot what it was it was like no use for a name party i remember in like and in, in, on mayhem or you remember the Mayhem that? Mixer? The oh mix? yeah, I forgot what we did for ours. We we made that that drink in the trash can. Yeah, that's what that made, was. I, I remember I jungle remember juice. Was, you guys made jungle juice and and there was sushi. But I remember you had like everyone had what kind the 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 theme of the party. It was like no no use for a theme party or something. Yeah. And it was one of the best parties. It was just like everybody was having a good time. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Thanks, man. Yeah, I remember that that stuff. We just bought every clear bottle of liquor we could find filled in a trash can. I got the idea from my dad, who's a Marine. He said they'd throw mojo parties. They'd buy every kind of alcohol they can get, pour it into a silver trash can and drink it. And they'd have to be up at like five in the morning the next day. Luckily, all of us band guys could just sleep in until we play. <laughs> awesome, my friend. Well, everybody, please check out the new Suicide Sounds record. Check out everything Mark does. Mark, thank you so much. Absolute pleasure. Great to see you. Stay in touch, my friend. All the best to you and the dudes. Great thank to see you. Sir. Thank yeah. you so much, my friend. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Friends, that was my amazing chat with Mark from Suicide Silence. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Matt from the band Trivium. We'll see you next time.